We'd love for you to worship with us. And I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you you call my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day You call my name And 
Oh, how long I've I chased river From lowly seas to where they ride Against the rush of grace descending From the source of its supply Cause in the highlands and the hearty You're neither more or less inclined And I would search and starve at nothing You're just not that hard to find And I will praise you on the mountain And I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the sun and where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadow No less faithful when the night leads me astray Cause you're the Your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinner's path. And know oh, how fast will you come running if just a shadow me through the night and trace my steps through all my failures. Valiant hill called Calvary Before the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me I will praise you on the mountain And I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the sun and where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadow No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heart it calls safe And I will praise you on the mountain 
And I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the song and where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadow No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Thank you, band. Thank you for watching online. My name is Brent, and I'm one of the pastors here at Cross City, and I just wanted to give you a special welcome. We're thankful that you're watching online. Would you do us a favor right now? Would you please just like, would you say hello? Let us know that you're watching online. We want this to be an interactive experience. In just a moment or two, uh, we're going to pause for uh, just a, a specific time of communion. So if you haven't already, make sure you get some bread and some juice, and we'll do that in just a moment. Hey, we we wanted to thank you uh, for so many of you that are continuing to show up on Sunday mornings outside at 8 a.m. And we want to encourage you to do that. Our plan is, is we're going to be doing that for the foreseeable future, definitely through August. Uh, we love worshiping with you online, Saturday nights at 6 o'clock, Sunday morning at 9, 15, uh, and 11 o'clock. Uh, but if you can, if you want to, you desire, we're adding more seats, we're adding more shade. And also maybe you might feel more comfortable bringing your own uh, 
chairs and umbrellas and sitting further away for more physical distance. We just are thankful that you're watching online, but if you feel comfortable, we'd love to have you join us on Sunday mornings as well. Hey, I wanted you to know uh, that a, a week from this Monday, on the 17th of this month, which seems really far away, but it's real soon, uh, the preschool here at Cross City, uh, crosscitypreschool.com, you can go take a look at it. Also watch social media. Uh, they have a few spots left because they are open for children uh, ages three to five, and that might be a great option for you or somebody that you know. Uh, we are going to be opening up under uh, uh, CDC protocols. Uh, uh, and we want you to know that that is a ministry that we have for you and for our church family and for our community. So if you'd like to find out more about that, go to the website uh, or call the church office and we'll get you uh, connected there. And there's a lot going on in the life of our church. If you don't already, we do hope that you follow us on uh, social uh, media. We know that there's much going on in the life of our, our church. And the way we stay connected is if you fill out those connection cards, you can come by uh, the church, drop off those connection cards in the frap house Monday. Monday through Friday. Uh, also, you can email us, prayer at mycrosscity.com, and we will pray for you. Uh, if you need assistance during this difficult, challenging time, you can email us, assistance at mycrosscity.com. Uh, and also, uh, if you would like to give, uh, you can do so uh, by texting uh, CC Fresno to 77977. And your giving really is making a difference. It makes the ministries of this church continue to go forward. Uh, we are seeing lives continue to be changed during this time. And after the message today, uh, we have several baptisms. And maybe you've been wondering, like, uh, is it time to be baptized? And we would say, absolutely. Uh, we're scheduling baptisms on Wednesdays right now. If you would like to get baptized or have questions about it, you can email us baptisms or baptism at mycrosscity.com. And a member of our uh, church staff will get in touch with you and we'll schedule a time for you to get baptized. We've got a great guest speaker uh, this weekend, uh, John Scott, a pastor down south. I believe this is his third uh, uh, Summer joining us as a guest speaker. You love him, we love him, uh, and we're just so thankful that he makes it a priority to be here uh, during the summer months. You're going to be blessed. We're in the Hebrews uh, teaching series, so make sure you grab your Bibles and follow along with us. Well, we're gonna come to that time uh, in our service where we pause and we receive communion together as a church family. Um, and what I've been thinking about is every week it seems like uh, there are guidelines, uh, there are expectations, there are mandates, there are those things that happen where we're told what we have to do. And we have a decision whether or not we wanna do them or not. And uh, sometimes we do them because we feel like we have to, sometimes because we're told to or because we think we should. But you know, the same is true as Christians. There are some things in scripture that we're told that we gotta do. Uh, Jesus says, if you're my follower, if you're my disciple, you're gonna do these things. And one of those is, is what we're gonna do right now. And that's gonna be celebrate the Lord's Supper. Jesus says, when you gather together, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take bread, which represents my life. And you're gonna take a cup, which represents my death. And you're going to remember me. This is my mandate. This is my commandment. And when you do this, uh, you're being obedient as my disciples. So would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. So God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to gather together as a church family. Thank you for the opportunity that we have now to take you at your word. And that is, is that when you say that we should do something, that we should do it. And so what we do now is we take the bread and we're thankful for your life, Jesus. And we take the cup and we're thankful for your death because of what you did. We don't have to be afraid of what's happening in this world that we're living in now because we have the confidence and the assurance of our salvation in heaven with you forever. We know that God, you're with us and that you're for us in the midst of this time. Time, God, would you be honored and glorified through everything that we do and say. Thank you for today. It's a day that you have made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. And it's in Jesus' powerful name that we pray. Amen and amen.
love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. So, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will say Of the goodness of God I love your voice And you have led me through the fire And in darkest night you were close like no other I've known you as a father And I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God Cause your goodness is running after It's running after Cross City. Uh, my name is John Scott, like uh, Brent said, and I just want to say it is always so good to be here. I've been looking forward to this. This is my third summer in a row to be with you and to join you and share God's word. Uh, for those of you maybe who were here last August when I was here, you might remember we had some problems with our vehicle and it broke down and all of that. Uh, we, we did make it home eventually, and then that same Jeep uh, got totaled. Just a couple months later, as a person pulled out right in front of me, but we're all good. Got another one. This time, no mechanical problems. We made it, and we're all good. I can't say, though, that this is like normal, right? This is like maybe the most confusing, different, crazy kind of time for all of us 
And uh, I just want to say thank you to Cross City because I, as I watch from a distance, I just see you continually doing great stuff in a very difficult and crazy time. So let me just applaud you and your church and your leadership and what you're doing. And, and maybe you are uh, tuning in for the very first time. Let me just say you found a good church. And if I lived in the Fresno Clovis area, man, this is the church I would want to be a part of. This is a church that's doing some, some great things uh, for the people who are a part of it, but then through the people who are this church into this community, that they're making a huge difference. And so I encourage you to keep tuning in, keep connecting, take those next steps, go to that discovery class, uh, get connected and make a difference. Uh, some of you may know that... Uh, Pastor David and I, we go way back. In fact, we've known each other almost 40 years. It's hard to believe because we're both in our 30s. But we have gone way, way back. And uh, we, we really, really do uh, appreciate each other. And it's always good to be here and to see what he and, and Sue Ann and, and their ministry has done in this place. So uh, I just say thank you for letting me be, be a part of this and, and share with you. If you're tuning in to watch Dave Dravecki, that was last week. And you can go online and watch that. He did a great, great job too. Uh, but I just want to kind of help you continue your series that you've been doing this, this summer of faith, going through the book of Hebrews. So if you have your, your Bible there, find Hebrews. And we're going to start reading in just a second. But let me also say this. Uh, during this weird time, uh, this COVID-19 season we've been in, uh, I've seen God do some pretty amazing things, haven't you? I mean, it, it's, it's frustrating at times. We can't do everything maybe we want to do the, the way we want to do it. But that doesn't mean God is not up to something really special. And maybe you've already thought about this or, or, or considered the idea, but, you know, just a few months ago was Easter. Maybe it, it's kind of like the church's Super Bowl of the year. We have our biggest attendances of the year and all of that. But this year, maybe, maybe than any other time, more than any other time in human history, people got to hear a clear presentation of the, of the, the message of Jesus. Uh, because while church doors were shut, the church wasn't stopped. And, and the church message went online like never before. And so God, I think God's using this season right now to do some incredible things. And maybe, maybe your life has been changed during the season in some very, very good and powerful ways. Well, as we dive into Hebrews, let me just say this. Uh, while we want God to work in our life, we've got to get God's word in us to work in us and through us. And we're going to dive into three little verses this weekend, which is kind of interesting because when I was talking to Pastor David about it, he said, I want you to continue the series. And I was like, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. And he gave me the verses and I had to laugh a little bit because they're talking about money and they're talking about leadership. But let's dive into it because it's good. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse five. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my help, helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of the way of their life and imitate their faith. Now, these are three very important and powerful and even personal verses. I think you're going to see that as we work our way through those. And if you're a note taker and you got your Bible out and you want to take some notes, let me just give you three things to think about today. The first one is this, be content. That's the challenge in verse five, be content. I don't know if uh, it's an issue for you, but it's an issue for me. Uh, is anybody else like technology? I mean, maybe you're watching this right now and you're in your pajamas and you're all comfortable and you got your phone and you got your tablet and you got your computer and everything's kind of close and handy. And you, you like that kind of stuff. I, I like that stuff too. And it's not uncommon for me to have three or four things going at the same time. I remember, in fact, when iPhones first came out. You remember that years ago when the, the very first iPhone came out? In fact, I couldn't get it right away. Even though a lot of my friends had already gotten theirs, I couldn't get it. And I was dying inside. I had to wait like six months after it came out in order to get mine. And the reason was because I was with a carrier that wouldn't support iPhone. If you remember, when they first came out, only AT&T carried it. And I was stuck in T-Mobile hell. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Some of you are probably offended that I said the word uh, T-Mobile. But here we go, right? So finally, I get out of that contract, and I get to go get my new phone. In fact, my whole family's going to get new phones. We jump in the car. We're on our way to the AT&T store, and a car pulls in front of me and totals that car. Like I told you, I got a car totaled last year. Well, this is years ago. 
Another car pulls right in front of me. We all get out. Nobody's hurt. And my girls say, Daddy, are we still going to go get some phones? I'm like, yep, because I was finally going to get an iPhone. I, nothing was going to stop me that day. But what happened was, uh, maybe this has happened to you. You finally get the thing that you think you have to have, and then they come out with a newer model. Yeah, that's when we cue the music, right? Like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> We get what we think we, we really want. It, it's going to make us happy. It's going it's to do everything. And then there's a newer model. We get that car we want. There's a newer model. We get that house we want. They, they start a new development. There, there's something about contentment that is difficult for us, especially in America. So look at verse 5 one more time. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now, see, the problem here is, uh, in a word, Greed. He says, the love of money. Now, by the way, money's not good or bad, right? You, you know that. In fact, it's not a bad thing to, uh, to have things. It's just a, not a good thing when your things have you. And that's what he's warning us about. Be, be content with what you have. Don't, don't be waking up in the middle of the night all the time, frustrated, thinking like, I really need this next thing, and i got to figure out how to get it and, and who to step over to get it, Right? Be content with what you have. And yet, that's a really difficult thing in our culture. There, there's a multi-billion dollar industry called marketing. And I will tell you, the underlying issue there for, for marketing, the, the underlying goal for every commercial ever is to make you feel discontented with what you have and make you want their toothpaste or phone or car, or whatever it is, right? The, the, the idea of marketing is to make you feel discontent. And it, since we're bombarded by that on a regular basis through radio and television and movies, and, you know, we, we have a phone, we have everything there, the web, we're, we're constantly reminded of what we don't have. And I think the machine that, that really fuels this whole thing in us is based on two huge myths. The first myth is really simple, and maybe you understand this, but it's kind of hard to really let it sink in. And it says something like this, my, my net worth determines my self-worth. Have you ever felt that way? I'm not as important as somebody else because they make more money. I, I'm not maybe as uh, special as somebody else because they have a better home or a better job. My, my net worth determines my self-worth, and actually that is a myth, in fact, I can tell you exactly how much you're worth. It has nothing to do with your bank account. It has nothing to do with your 401k or 403b or whatever you put away for retirement. It has nothing to do with your stock portfolio. I can tell you exactly what you're worth. And it's based on a free market system. It goes something like this. Something is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. Now think about this. Uh, on, on the side, I do photography. and It killed me this week when we were coming from Mammoth over here. and We were going to spend a little bit of time in Yosemite and I didn't make a reservation. I didn't know you had to. So they stuck a thing on our windshield and said, you can go through here, but you can't stop. And my wife literally said, can he stop and take pictures? And they said, no, right? So I do the photography thing. And every now and then uh, I sell a few things. And, and, and if I were to say to you, I have this one picture, it's absolutely beautiful of the last time I was in Yosemite or, or a mammoth or a sunset on the beach, and it's worth $10,000, that would maybe sound impressive. But if I can only find somebody who gives me $300 for that, guess what it's worth? $300. It's not worth $10,000. It's worth what someone's willing to give. See, when you go to sell your car, we have all kinds of tools that help us determine the value. We have Kelly Blue Book, and we have all kinds of resources and tools online. But what if you have like a 1951 four-door Chevy that's in pretty good shape? Like, how do you figure that out? It's simple. It's worth what someone is willing to pay. Now, what does this have to do with my net worth really doesn't determine my self-worth? Here it is. You, this is how much you're worth. You are worth the blood of Jesus. The Bible says it wasn't with silver or gold that he redeemed us or paid the price for us. It was with the precious blood of Jesus. That's how much you're worth. And so, so that myth that my net worth somehow determines my self-worth, we, we got to just let that go and realize that we are extremely valuable based on the price that God was already willing to pay. Now, myth number two, the more money I have, the more happy I'll be. Yeah, maybe we've all bought into that a little bit. I'm not sure I've ever turned down a raise, right? I still want a little bit more money would be okay, 
but more money doesn't make us more happy. 20 years ago, it was my first time to go to Cambodia. I went there to help train pastors and church planters, and God is doing some really, really amazing things in Cambodia. I don't know if you know that, but it's really, really, really good stuff. 20 years ago, my first time there, um, there was an orphanage near where we were doing our training, and the little kids would come by, and they would play in the church you know, area. There was no grass. It's just dirt. And they were playing soccer with one of the kids' flip-flops because they didn't have a ball. They didn't have anything, really. They had one sandal they kicked around in the dirt, and they were so happy. They were so happy. In fact, while I didn't speak the language, I had someone translating for me all the time. The one thing that I never heard from any of those kids or any of those adults was this. I'm bored, right? I never heard that. That made such an impression on me. I I came back, and both of my girls were young at the time, and I came back, and I told them the story of the kids playing soccer with a flip-flop. And I said, you know, they never said, I'm bored. Man, we we seem to have everything that, that we want in America, and yet we're bored. Something about this has to ring true at some point. Like, more stuff isn't going to make us happy. There, there's something else that's going to get us there. Our, our church continually uh, sponsors and works with some slums in Nairobi, Kenya. And I've been there a few times. And you, know, you see, again, people with absolute poverty, and you can't wipe the smile off their face. You know why? Because they have Jesus. Have you ever heard that phrase, like, Jesus is enough? Yeah, that's what it means. Like, I don't have to have all that other stuff. And it's okay to drive a nice car, live in a nice house, but like, that's not what's going to make you happy. Jesus is enough. And we're going to have to go to him. One, one more time, verse 5, he says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now, that's a short version of what the Apostle Paul gives in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Listen, listen to this. He actually gives us a little bit more. Verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, here's that same phrase again. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Have you ever noticed anybody get into trouble because of greed? You probably have. Maybe it's been you. Maybe maybe it's been me at times where... We just get this all mixed up. The Bible actually has a lot to say about this. One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Proverbs. It's packed full of wisdom about life and relationship and marriages and parenting and friendships and money. And it talks a lot about money. And one of the things it warns about repeatedly, like he warns us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, is to to stay away from these get-rich-quick schemes because you're going to fall into some trouble. I may step on some toes here, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyway. You're probably in your slippers, and it's going to hurt more than if you would have had your shoes on, sitting there in your pajamas all comfy-like, right? One of the issues I see, especially in America, is a thing that we call entertainment, and we say, are you ready? It's gambling. I'm not going to say you should or shouldn't. I'm just going to say, I think the reason gambling is such a big deal is because it's fueled by our greed, because of our love of money. We want to get rich. We want to cut corners. We want to get there however we can, and it gets us into trouble. And so what I've told my church, I say, you know, if you choose to do that, that's your choice. I'm not telling you it's right or wrong. I just see, I just see a trap there, but let me, let me help you. There is a home version you can play, and I just want to encourage you. In fact, you're online right now. You're sitting at home. You could actually do this today if you want to. All right, so if you're kind of like, you're one of those gamblers and you're saying, you know what, I just, I just take $20 with me and I sit at the slot and I just do that or I play cards, whatever, and whenever my money's gone, I'm done. I just, I just do it for entertainment value. That's fine, you can do that at home. Take that $20 and lay it in the toilet and then flush, you ready? Whoosh, wow, it's so much fun just watching it. It goes around and around and around and then it's gone, right? Now, if you get a kick out of that, you can do it again. Throw another 20 in. Just keep doing it, right? 
as ridiculous as that sounds, is how, is how easily we get caught up in this, this greed thing, this love of money thing. And while we're getting caught up in that, the thing that's going around and around and around and finally disappears is, is us. We've got to be careful. He says, be content. But the second thing I want you to make a note of is this, be trusting. Be trusting. He comes out with one of the greatest promises in the Bible in this next section. And I want you to listen carefully to it. At the end of verse 5, he says, Because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's a promise for the ages. Verse 6, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? For, for me, the word confidence here is the word trust. I'm, I'm going to trust in him. Look at the promise again. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. What? Well, 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 forsake you. Well, why did he give us that promise? Because instead of trusting in things to bring happiness and fulfillment, and, and instead we're going to be content and we're going to lean on him. He says, because you're not going to be a lover of money, you're going to be a lover of me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That, that's the context of that verse. That's the context of that proverb or that, that promise. But he says, I, we can say this with Confidence, the Lord is my helper. The reason I'm using the word trust is uh, I want you to think of it this way. When I bring to God, when I bring to God my tithe, it's that first portion of what I've, I've earned, like God gave me the ability to get a job and all of that. It's like the, the very first portion I give back to him. It's a matter of trusting that he is the kind of God who's going to keep his promises. My wife and I, uh, years and years and years ago. I'd just become the pastor of the church. I'd, I'd been on staff for three years before that, and then I became the pastor. This was back in late 1990. So in early 1991, we were actually doing a, a stewardship, giving financial series at our church. And we had invited our people to, to read the, the scriptures and, and to pray about what God was calling them to give. And and how to make that a priority in their life. And so my wife and I did the same thing. In fact, for three weeks, we agreed that we were going to pray about it separately and not talk to each other about it. And at the end of three weeks, we said, okay, now, how much do you think we should give? Now, let me back up a little bit. We got married in 1988. And right before we get married, my wife says, hey, I did this budgeting class. Do you mind if I work on the budget for us? And I'm saying, no, not at all. And so, uh, you know, she, she had her apartment, I had my house, and so she's going to move into my house when we get married, and she says, okay, so let, how much are the utilities, and how much is the house payment, and how much is this, how much is this, she's working on the budget. And then she says, do you tithe? And I said, you mean give 10% to the church? And she said, yes. I said, yeah, I do. And she goes, good, me too. I didn't want to be one of those couples, you know, that argues about that. So at the end of our first year of marriage, we actually went up to 11%. The next year, we went to 12%. And my wife says, are we just going to keep doing this? Well, this is the same time our church is going through this thing and we're praying about what we're going to do. So instead of just making it 13%, we said, let's, let's pray about it for three weeks. So we did. At the end of three weeks, we came back together. We sit down and I said, okay, so how much do you think we should give? And she goes, I don't want to go first. I want to know what you think. I said, I don't want to go first. I want to know what you think. She says, I don't want to go first. I, and I said, you know, anyway, it went on for a while. Finally, one of us caved and we said, we should try to give 20%. That was in January, February, 1991. And we've been given 20% or more of our income to the church. And we, we support kids in Kenya. There, there's other things we give to beyond that. And I'm not saying that so that you can say, wow, you guys are really special. No, we're really not. We just trust that our God is who he says he is. And the more we give, the more we see what he does in our life and then, and then through our life. Check out this verse in Leviticus. I know this is Old Testament, but this is powerful stuff. Leviticus 27, verse 30, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. I mean, it is set apart. That's what the word holy means. It's set apart for him. By the way, that word holy is such a cool word. The Bible actually says that we're holy now. As followers of Jesus, we're holy. What, what does that mean? So it means we're not ordinary. When I was a little kid growing up, my dad was good with tinkering with cars and stuff, an ability I really never got, even though he tried to show me. And he had tools that I could touch and I could play with, and then he had his tools. Ah, 
They were holy, right? Some of you grew up in a home where you had a, a china cabinet, and you had the really nice dishes, and you only got them out like at Thanksgiving and Christmas and maybe a birthday, and then the rest of the time they're stored up in the cabinet. Like, oh! They were holy, right? They were set apart for just special occasions. He says the tithe is holy. That, that first portion of our income, it's holy. And then he says it belongs to the Lord. I got in real trouble about this one one time. I read that verse and I was preaching on this, talking about this. And I said, I'm just, I'm just going to think out loud here for a minute. And I'll, I'll tell you what I said. And I'll tell you how somebody took it and why they left the church. Here's what I said. If the first portion literally belongs to God, then if I use that first portion for anything else, I'm stealing from God. If I take what belongs to him and I use it on vacation, if I take what belongs to him and I use it on a car payment, if I take what belongs to him and I use it on my house, I'm stealing from God. In fact, that's what he says in Malachi. You're, you're stealing from me. Well, I got in big trouble by this one family and they left and I found out this is how they heard it. You can't have nice things. Never said that. I just said the first part belongs to God. And when we give to him our tithe, it shows that we trust him to keep his promises. It shows that we, we affirm that, that it all belongs to him. And here's the cool thing. And it fuels his mission. For those of you who are part of Cross City, man, when you give to Cross City, you are doing some really, really good stuff for the cause of Christ in this place and in other places in the world that this, this church supports. You're doing amazing things together. When we tithe, when we return what, what belongs to God, that very first portion, it just reminds us that it all belongs to him. But again, maybe this isn't an American thing, but I, I sure see it a lot. In fact, I have a granddaughter. She's a year and a half old. Absolutely cute. Absolutely a blast to be around. I want to be called Poppy someday. And right now I'm just pop, pop. But that's cool enough, man. And I'm loving it. I'm digging it. Well, the other day we were down at the beach and we were having some of our vaca vacation time and our family was there and some extended family there and some cousins were there. And the cousins are a little bit older than her. She's, again, just 18 months old. And they started talking about something and they said, it's mine, it's mine. And then she just repeats them, mine. And like, I could see my daughter's face, the mom of my granddaughter, just like, no, I don't want her to know that word yet, right? Mine. But no, when we tithe, when we give to God first, it shows we know it's all his. The first portion we give back to him, but, but the rest of it, we still get the privilege of managing God's stuff in a way that honors him. Second Corinthians chapter nine says this, look at this, verse six. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now I read that because it's just one place in many in the Bible where it read, kind of reminds us of God's promises. And again, we're, we're trusting that he's going to take care of us. And so even though we're, we're not going to wait till the end of the month to see if we have anything left to give God, that would just be leftovers. We're going to do it first and then trust him to take care of all these things. That, that's, a, that's a huge shift, right? Michelle and I made our commitment to do 20% back early 1991. 1995 rolls around and it's the worst year in our church's history. Financially, it was a horrible time. But literally, we were three and a half months behind in my salary for most of that year. Three and a half months. Every now and then, we'd get a check. We're supposed to get a check twice a month. It would just be like every three to five to six weeks, maybe I'd get a check. But every time we got a check, we still gave our 20% off of that because that was our commitment. And even though we didn't have anything else like waiting and, and a bunch of stuff in the bank, like God came through for us over and over and over. I don't even have time to give you all of them. I, mean, I remember one time we were supposed to make our house payment. The next day our house payment was like $1,000. We didn't have any money left and we get a check in the mail for just a little over $1,000. The, the day before it's due. We had other times where we got money. In fact, we, we got money from sources we didn't even know about or we didn't know that they knew anything about our situation. We just had money come our way to provide for us. But maybe my my favorite story about that whole year was in February, 
1995, three and a half months behind our salary. By the way, God provided. We never did miss a house payment. Never got pink slipped on the utility. Never got, uh, never missed a meal. God, God completely took care of us. But in February, we, we knew of a single mom with, uh, I think, four kids, all pretty young, like under the age of six. And they recently were separated uh, from her husband, and then he committed suicide. So she's literally all alone with these four little kids. And we didn't have much, but we said, you know, we could give her something. So we, we put together $40. We gave it to somebody else to give to her so it would be anonymous. We just say, hey, can you make sure she gets that? That was in February. Every Sunday for six months after that, somebody put a box or boxes of food by my car or on our front porch at our house that I would say, no joke, would total at least $40 worth of food. We gave somebody $40 one time, and God gave us $40 of food every week for six months. We just, we just saw God come through in so many different ways. One time, Michelle and I were talking about something that we wanted to do. We wanted to go to this, this conference in the summertime that would recharge our batteries, and it was a difficult year, and, and I hadn't lost faith or anything like that, but you know, it'd be nice to have some good news, right? And we wanted to go, and we just didn't have the money. The church didn't have the money to send us, and she says, well, why don't we pray about it? I'm like, I'm supposed to say that. Like, I'm the pastor, right? So we got down on our knees in front of the ugliest couch ever invented, and it was given to us, and so we used it. We, we got on our knees, and we prayed, and no kidding, the money came the next day. It's not like some preacher exaggeration. But we're able to do some things that we've been wanting to do. And going to that conference was one of them. God does come through. But, but there's one more thing I want you to see as we get to this last verse. And remember, it's, it's all connected. Here it is. Be all in. And if you're taking notes, write that down. Be all in. And let's go to verse 7. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Hey, don't miss this. Verse five and six and seven are connected. They really are. I never knew how much until I became the pastor back in 1990 at the end of that year. I had a meeting with uh, four gentlemen. I knew they weren't happy. I still remember the setting. I put my chair in my office. I went and got four chairs, put them in my office, and I was ready. I, I knew who was coming. I knew they weren't happy. They sit down. Their spokesman says to me, I'm 27 years old, by the way, the new, newly crowned pastor of this little tiny church who had just gone through some horrible stuff. And they said, if you don't change things back to the way we want them, we and a lot of other families we know are going to stop tithing. I'm, I'm going to just be honest with you. I didn't even blink. This is what I said. Wow, I'm really sorry. That means you have to find another church, doesn't it? Because tithing is a spiritual issue. And if you don't trust the leaders here to tithe and you stop tithing, you're the ones that are going to be hurt. The church is going to go on with or without you. By the way, I really didn't know if the church would survive. I just knew it was the truth. And so I said it. All four of those families left the church. Our church kept moving, kept going. By, by the way, two of them came back like a year, two years later. He said, you know, we, we're very sorry. Would you forgive us? Well, of course. We welcome back into the family. But I, but I saw at that moment, like the connection between verses five and six and verse seven. See, they were, they were trying to manipulate the system. They, they didn't want to go along with the leader that God had placed in that place or, or the other leaders who were a part of that church. None of them were our, our staff. None of them were our elders. But they just knew that they could manipulate or thought they could manip manipulate the system. But let me tell you how you can do what he says in this verse. Verse 7, he says, remember your leaders. This is what he's getting at. I would say one thing is just pray for them. And I mean pray for them regularly, consistently, faithfully pray for them. Let me say something about prayer that's pretty important. Um, I, started, I started losing my hair when I was 18 years old. Yeah, that was a hard pill to swallow. 18 years old. And I used to have hair that was so thick, they literally had to thin it before they could cut it. That's how thick my hair was. And then it just started going away. It was horrible. I mean, through my college years, you could just see it was just going away. In my early 20s, they're, they're, I'm going to be bald. I just know it, right? One of my friends asked me, he said, do you ever pray for hair? <laughs> and I'm like, absolutely, almost nightly. 
And then it started growing on my back. Yeah, here's the point. Be specific in prayer. You know, so when you pray for your leaders, pray for them by name. Go to, go to your website, to your homepage, and, and find where it shows you all of your staff. You have names and pictures. And I mean, pray for them. Pray for their marriages. Pray for their families. Pray for, here's the biggie, wisdom. This is the craziest time in ministry, in 40 years of ministry I've been a part of. This whole COVID-19 thing. How do we manage this? How do we navigate this? Your leaders right now are on a retreat, praying and planning and dreaming for this church. And before we're done, I'm going to pray for your leaders. And I want you to continue to pray for them too. It, it is a weird time. I was, I was riding my bike one day. I, I loved a mountain bike. And I was just coming back from a ride. And I saw a guy walking his dog, and I know the guy pretty well. And so I kind of pulled my bike over the side, and he stopped his dog, you know. And he says, how are you doing? And so we talked for a little bit. And he doesn't go to our church regularly, but he's been in Easter here and there. And he says, are you getting to ride a lot more? And I said, no, not any more than usual. I'm pretty busy. And he says, really? What are you doing? He thought the church was closed, like not doing anything. And I'm like, this has been one of the busiest seasons of my life. Just figuring it out and keeping content available to people on a regular basis. It's not easy. And I appreciate every single person who is praying for me through that. And I know your leaders appreciate your prayers. Another thing you can do is encourage them. And it's just as simple as maybe a card. I know it's old fashioned to actually put something in a mailbox and have it sent to somebody else. But I, you know, we can get emails and texts and they, they mean a lot to us. But man, when you get something in the mail and just open it up and somebody took the time to write something to say they appreciate that, that's encouraging. I, I, I probably am the only one in my church that knows this, but I'm going to let it out of the bag for you guys in case, like our church, your church may not know this. The month of October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Ah, maybe you didn't know that. I don't think anybody in my church does. The only card I would get was from my mom, right? <laughs> But that's what the month is about. It's about to encourage your pastors. Can you not just wait for October? Encourage them now. It says, remember your leaders. Pray for them. Encourage them. And, and follow their lead. I don't mean blindly. You know, we, we've seen the problems of that. We've seen cults go off the deep end. We, we've seen the Kool-Aid. We, we know what can happen. But follow them. The church in Berea used to make sure what Paul was saying was true according to the scripture. But we still follow. See, what I realized is most problems in the church aren't over biblical issues, right? They're, they're over preference issues. And in one word, I could divide a church. In one word, I could split a church. In one word, I could create havoc. You ready for the word? Here it is. Three, wait, three, two, one. Here's the word, music. You guys have an amazing band here, by the way. Trevor and that team just absolutely kill it week after week after week. But there's a whole lot of churches that have been split over the issue of music. It's not a biblical thing. It's a preference thing. So I'm going to encourage you to follow your leaders. In fact, later on in the same chapter, down in verse 17, this is what it says. Look, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. He says, you know, follow your leaders, encourage your leaders, pray for your leaders, make them great leaders, and they will be somebody you'll want to follow. And then together, we can be the church that makes a huge difference. Back up in verse 7 again, he says, I want you to imitate them. Not, not because they're perfect people. The Apostle Paul said it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. Like, Jesus is the one we're going to follow. But you pray up, you encourage up, you support your leaders. You're going to continue to challenge them as you pray for them for wisdom. You're going to continue to, to help them be the leaders that God wants them to be, the kind of people that you can follow and you can imitate their life. Yeah, Jesus is the one we're going to follow. And maybe, uh, maybe that's a new concept to you. I encourage you to stay connected here at Cross City. Stay connected and, and ask your questions and use the chat and uh, use the email, and make a phone call, connect with somebody. I know this is a weird time. We're not all just coming together. But take that next step and find out more about Jesus if you're curious. I'm going to tell you there's some great people here who will help you with that. 
And as I wrap this up, as we've been talking about, I just want to just take some time to pray for the leaders of this great church. Can we do that together? God, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for the wisdom of your word in Hebrews chapter 13. And thank you so much for Pastor David, Pastor Brent, uh, the other pastors and leaders, the elders of this church. We, we ask God your blessing on them. God, be with their marriages, be with their families. And as we said, God, give them wisdom. As they, as they went away this weekend just to pray and to plan, I pray, God, you were able to pour into them by your spirit and direct them. It may not be just from this weekend, but, but continually day after day after day, by your spirit, direct them so that this church can be the beacon of hope in this community that it needs to be. Thank you, God. Thank you for Cross City and thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Thank you, guys. See you next time. Hey, Cross City. Thanks for sticking around today. Uh, don't close that browser yet. We've got a couple of baptisms to celebrate today. So this is... Diane. Welcome, Diane. And Diane, today is it your decision to declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yes. Re please repeat after me. I believe... I believe... That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. Diane, upon that profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, congratulations. Okay, and today this is? Loopy. Loopy, welcome Loopy. So, Loopy, is it your decision today to declare Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Would you repeat after me? I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. Son of the living God. Loopy, upon that profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is? Lisa. Lisa. Lisa, is it your decision today to declare Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Would you repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ. The, Son of the, living God. the Son of the living God. Upon that profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. Okay, and this is? Renee. Renee. Renee, is it your decision today to declare Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Would you repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. Upon that profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. My name is Frankie. Uh, this is our church right here, and this is my sister Maribel. So today she decided to uh, give her life to Jesus Christ. So, Maribel, uh, is it your desire to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Expressing that, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Well, hey, church, this is Jenny. She's coming to be baptized today. Jenny, I got a question for you. Is it your desire today to declare Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Awesome. Repeat after me. I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the, Christ. the Son of the living God. Yes. Jenny, it's based on that decision of your faith that I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Church, thank you for sticking around so much so far. This is the last one we have this weekend. This is Michael Curtis. He's a senior in our high school ministry here. His family's here watching. Michael, I got a question for you. Is it your desire today to declare Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes, sir. Right on, brother. Repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. Michael, it's based on that profession of your faith that I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church, make it a great week. Thank you so much.
Don't know.